Okay, can everyone hear me? Uh, if you can hear me, please like uh, put in the chat chat box that you can hear me or like. Uh, Okay, so um, welcome to another week of Logic STEM Physics. Uh, I'm Jerry Liu. Uh, I am the vice director. And uh, today we're going to just continue on to this pattern of motion. So we're going to um, today talk about a general formulas, general formulas for motion in two to three dimensions. So, um, what we mean by this is that uh, when we fire anything, we normally do it from an angle, which means that you cannot use like general you cannot use like the general kinematic formulas by themselves to like represent motion. So, imagine for example you're throwing a ball. This ball travels um, horizontally and vertically, so you have to have two. Um, dimensions in order to be able to accurately de denote this type of motion. So how we would do this in mass, right, is to use a, a two-dimensional coordinate system because that's the easiest way to represent two-dimensional anything. So what we mean by this is that, um, let's say we have this, uh, whoops, let's say we have this um, motion A here, right? We can break this into a uh, a X and A Y. So you would have uh, X representing the horizontal portion of the motion and Y representing the vertical portion of uh, this type of motion. It is very important to note that these two motions run completely independently of one another. That means that one will not influence the other. A X will run um, in a uh, a separate manner than AY and forces affecting AY will not affect AX. The only thing that is constant and therefore um, notable uh, that is shared between these two is T, which in this case is the constant that connects these two. Um, T is the same. So but normally when you try to solve for any one of these portions and try to be able, and try to reach the other one, you would have to solve for T. Um, these two expressions that are like um that look like a line connected by an arrow is this is called a vector and uh here you would denote this as this motion a is equal to the sum of a x plus a y we'll get into vector addition later but just to know that like these two are the two portions that make up this entire thing um another term that we should define is a unit vector which is just the vector of magnitude one so that one's kind of self-explanatory. You may have heard of things like the unit circle before. It's the same thing, but instead it's applied to a vector. Now, um, when we try to solve for this, we would solve for a displacement vector that is um, that it basically denotes a particle at time t that um, is located at p1, like some random point um, in respect to time, so it's position versus time. And obviously the position would change. So um, in order to be able to calculate the difference or like the distance traveled on um, this displacement, remember not distance, the displacement um, is equal to uh, R of T2 minus R times T1. Uh, let's see, okay, that's better. So next we will talk about the velocity vector. So the velocity vector is, um, the, is basically the, the derivative of the position function with respect to time. Um, velocity, you, you, you guys may have heard this before, but it's basically speed, um, but with direction. And how you would get that was from position is, um, is by taking the derivative. derivative. Uh, so, um, 
this is basically the same thing. You can still use derivatives here, um, but in two to three dimensions, this will obviously be the slope of this vector, and it will it will basically you can just represent um, this velocity constant as like a vector. Acceleration is the derivative of the velocity. It's basically um, how much this velocity changed divided by time and average acceleration, just like average velocity is, the, is equal to the change in acceleration over time. Well, um, that's basically like the basics of what type of math we need to be able to solve this type of problem. So now we will just go into some basic concepts for like review um, before we start um, going into problems. So um, one thing that's important to note is that everything in physics that's being observed must have a frame of reference. Um, this frame of reference is basically where you are viewing this type of motion from. And this can drastically change what type of numbers or what type of speeds you will be able to see. So um, in this type of case, this the velocity of an object as observed from a particular reference frame varies depending on the choice. So let's say um, we have this man, right? Um, and he is walking a diagonally um, on top of the roof of a train, but the train is moving in a constant motion. Now, how would the man's um, motion look like? What would it look like? Um, if you guys know you feel free to put the answer in the chat. Okay, so um, you, you can think about it like this. When this man is walking vertically, every single second, he would first walk vertically, but the train carries this, um, his position to another location. So his overall net like motion would be um, a longer, but more slanted uh, vector. So you can, express this quantitatively by let's say his direction of motion is VPC, his velocity of motion. And then the train moves at a velocity of VCG. You would basically do vector addition, which is basically um, adding the two X and Y coordinates of the vectors to create a new one. This would, when we add vectors, it would create a third like of a triangle, like what we see here. So let's say we have um, vectors VPC and VCG, when you add these up, it would basically form the third side of the triangle if we consider these as two sides of the triangle. And this would be your general motion. Um, if at any point you guys have any types of questions or if you have any current concerns or you don't understand something, feel free to just say it out loud. Um, I cannot access the chat so easily, so it's better um, if you guys just um, speak, speak it out. Okay, so um, in the first week, we did talk about one dimensional motion. That means that a, an object is traveling horizontally or vertically, and it cannot be both. It's just traveling in one direction, but there's still forces such as obviously gravity affecting it. Now, when we talk about projectile motion, this is that includes that. It includes one dimensional motion, but it also includes um, motion that are through multiple dimensions. Projectile is something that's being, that's coursing through motion, typically being thrown in common English. Uh, so a motion of an object that's through the air is obviously subject um, really only to the acceleration of gravity and maybe air resistance. Uh, as we talked about before, make sure to remember that horizontal and vertical equations of motion behave independently. The reason I keep on stressing this is because when you guys do the math and we start going into the kinematic, kinematic equations and methods to solve um, these types of problems, it is very important to make sure one equation doesn't affect the other. Don't just plug in like um, 
V0x, for example, and think that V0y has like some direct relationship to it. It does not work. It does not work like that. And if you guys do it, your answers can be wrong. So uh, it's very important to remember this, that, th that these are two independent forces acting. Normally mass, like you would often see, oh, vertical motion acting in respect to horizontal motion, but it does not work like that here. So um, now imagine this, two people are holding balls, right? One person uh, holds it uh, just at a certain height and just simply drops the ball and waits for it to fall to the ground, okay? And another person pushes the ball a little and then at the same time and both of these balls fall to the ground now which one do you guys think will fall first or sorry which one will reach the ground first so let's say you have two balls right um one is just being dropped no outside force is being applied to it right and um at the same time, so at this time t equals zero, another ball is being launched at um, a speed v zero x. Now, which ball will hit the which ball will hit the floor first? Given uh, obviously that it's the same distance being that that's being that it's being dropped from, and they start at the same time. Okay, so I have some answers. So um, the correct answer is actually that they land on the ground at the same time. Now, although uh, the vertical drop is obviously a shorter distance than the horizontal drop, uh, the thing is, is that this launch speed is basically, all, this also impacts the distance. So, yeah, it's, it's because of gravity. Um, so, the, so basically what, uh, what this lacks in like short distance, what this uh, being launched horizontally, what it lacks in like short shortness of distance, it actually makes up for, for having a launch speed and this can propel um, the force of gravity. So they will actually land at the same time. Now, how we can, um, look at a general projectile motion, like for example, being launched horizontally, uh, this path is a parabolic path. That means that this path follows the same shape as a parabola. And the reason that we know this is that, well, you can actually apply the first kinematic equation to it. Basically this equation that describes the displacement. So, um, this equation states that the displacement is equal to the initial velocity. Note this time it is um, of one component, specifically the y component, minus one half of gt squared, g being that constant, my, um, 9.8 meters per second squared. Uh, this is used to solve for the y component, but this does not impact x. x, um, when we launch it at a horizontal speed, um, the velocity in the x component will always remain constant. It will never stop. And uh, thus, all you have to do to find um, the horizontal like lanes or the horizontal lanes traveled or like the target lanes, all you have to do is multiply this given initial velocity by time. So we can say like, um, there's no acceleration in the horizontal component. So AX equals zero, VX or just the normal velocity is equal to V zero X, the initial velocity. And the displacement is equal to uh, V zero X times T. Now for the Y component, it does not actually work like that. We, we know that um, when two things are being dropped, uh, the acceleration is always gonna be negative G. You can see it in like, um, this diagram where um, each of these like individual snap, you can call it like snapshots or moments of marked of a of these balls descents, 
these are actually in terms of like this let's say it's actually this photo came from a strobe light picture of a ball of two balls falling and this time increment between each snapshot was about 0.1 seconds but this time increment was constant now as you guys can tell actually each of these balls remain at the same height from the origin or no sorry not from the origin but from um the ground or in this case the x-axis so this can actually just show that like this y component just acts as an individual y component it is not influenced by the x component both of these remain actually happen at they're basically always at the same height if um they're they're dropped at the same time and the time measured is constant so uh thus basically what applied for one dimensional motion also applies here in the fact that a is equal to um 9.8 meters per second squared um, your final velocity is equal to your velo initial velocity plus at, or in this case, minus gt. And then your kinematic equations also apply to the y motion, but not the x. So remember that. Uh, okay, so next. Another thing to consider is what if we're not launching horizontally? Um, let's say we have this initial velocity, basically V zero, and but we are launching it at an angle theta. So you can think about it, one example of this being a cannon. A cannon is almost never launched horizontally. It's almost always tilted at an angle. So how do you map the path of this cannon? Well, just like what we did with horizontal motion, you can actually diagram it and then break down um, the path and, and the, thus the speeds into X and Y components. So um, here we have two vectors, right? V0, X and V0, Y, they're obviously the X and Y components. And they add up by doing vector addition, they basically add up to your initial velocity vector. Um, we do, we do not need to like um, find a time here. This is basic. This always represents instantaneous velocity, never average velocity. So um, you guys do not need to multiply by t or do any of those things. It only makes it harder. Now, what we see here inside this triangle, it's, it's a right triangle, obviously, because the x and y are perpendicular. So we can thus express each of these, each of the magnitudes of these vectors by um, v0 and theta, the angle. So obviously we have v0x being the same as v0 times cosine theta, and we have v0y being v0 times sine theta, just due to basic trigonometry. Thus, if we apply this here, you can say that like ax is always equal to zero. Um, the initial displacement for the x um, component is also zero. Vx is all is equal to V0x, which is equal to V0 cosine theta, and x equals to V0t, which is equal to V0t cosine theta. Now, you guys do not have to remember these um, specific formulas for uh, the horizontal and vertical motions. All you have to do is remember that in case the launch is not directly horizontal, you must try to use trigonometry to find the initial x velocity and the initial y velocity. And you can take these separately and use the same thing that you do to map out or like find the distance or find the time of um, a horizontal, sorry, of a normal like two, two dimensional general motion, which is basically to plug it into, into basically to plug it into the respective equations. Uh, I'm not gonna go really into the why thing because it's too complicated and you guys can actually use different kinematic equations. It doesn't have to be just this. You can say, you can write this in terms of like VFT, if you know what the final velocity is in a problem, it doesn't necessarily have to be initial. But you guys, if you guys know the kinematic equations, you have to know that these two have to act separately. Um, you have to use the trigonometric, like basic trigonometric identities to figure out like what the X and the Y um, speeds are.
that's pretty much it. And then the rest of it basically just relies on common sense. Um, any questions so far? Uh, okay, so I'm gonna. Okay, so I'm gonna continue. Trajectory um, is obviously the path that's taken when an object is in flight. Uh, here, you have to relate it in terms of y and x. So x is obviously equal to these. Um, and the range is basically like, you, you can just take it as uh, this horizontal distance. It's equal to v0 squared times sine of 2 theta divided by g. This is basically how you get it. OK, so you, do, you guys do not need to know most of these for like, all you have to do is be able to map like and solve for time, horizontal distance and stuff to get through most of the contest problems. This is just limited to a few difficult ones. Okay, so next we're gonna start going to some sample problems now that uh, we have our basic tools. So, um, Here's our first question. This is a very common question in like physics classes. Um, it's basically basic, basic two-dimensional kinematics. So um, we're gonna do this one together and then I'll let you guys try the next question. So a person kicks the ball with an initial velocity of 15 meters per second. So that's V zero. At an angle 37 degrees, that's theta above horizontal. So that means that as you can see in the diagram, if you have your horizontal ground, then it's, so this incline on of the V0 vector is 37 degrees. Um, we're, for now, we're gonna ignore air resistance and just map the path. So we have, our goal is to find the total time T, the balls in the air and the horizontal distance or, um, or delta x traveled by the ball. So how you would do this is, as, as we've talked about earlier on, you would say uh, d0 times like sine like 37. This is equal to v0 sorry, v0y, and then v0 times cosine of 37 equals to v0x. So um, now, now we know that what like v0y is, we can just use our kinematic equations to try to solve it. So we will use the one relating what distance is relative to initial time, time and acceleration, because those are two things we know. So that equation states that delta y um, is equal to v0y. Note the notation here. Um, if you guys had to do this in a free response problem, that means a problem that asks you to show your work and they'll grade you on how accurate your work is. Note that you may not be able to say V0. You have to break it down into X and Y components. Otherwise, they'll mark you as wrong for like ambiguity. You must say V0Y, V0X, or you can also say VIY and VIX if you guys are familiar with that type of notation. I here would stand for initial. So you have V zero Y um, T minus, uh, you would obviously have here one half times 9.8 and then times T squared. Now we know that Delta Y is actually ultimately equal to zero 
because we started from the ground and we'll land at the ground. So therefore the total displacement covered is zero. And you, obviously you can plug in um, V0 is 30, this V0Y is 37 times, uh, sorry, <laughs> this is 15 um, times sine of 37. So here we have a basic quadratic equation. You guys don't even need to use like the quadratic formula to solve this. All you have to do is plug in the appropriate numbers. Um, now, this step would probably need a graphing calculator or like some other type of calculator that will enable you to be able to apply um, like trigonometric equations. So here, this was degrees. Um, if you guys want to follow along, please like at this point, um, grab a graphing calculator or like any type of calculator that allows for trigonometric functions. Because we'll have a lot of trigonometric functions um, when we try solving these. Now, um, again, we have this, and then we have t is would be equal to two times 15 of sine of 37 over 9.8, this is approximately like 1.84 seconds. Um, so we can say that x is equal to, we, we can disregard the x zero in this, con in this um, context. Um, x zero is almost always gonna be zero. Um, it's only when the problem specifically talks about like something moving first and then um, launching, then this would not be zero. But here we could disregard this and we can just say that this is gonna be V zero X times T. So one of the formulas you guys can try to remember is that the displacement of one of the, of the X component given the, like the constant um, X velocity will always be equal to this um, initial velocity in the X component times T. We went over this, but it's a very important equation for two dimensional motion and uh, it's good to just either jot that down in notes and stuff. Well, either way, we come up with 15 um, times cosine of 37 and then times our time, which is here 1.84. This is about 22.08 meters. So that's part A and B. So we have A being about 1.84 and B being about 22.08. Um, is everyone clear on that? Okay. So I would like you guys to try um, this problem. Now this problem, the only difference is that your initial um, y is not zero. It's um, 50 meters from the top of a building. But um, your goal is to find how long it takes to reach the top of the path. So. You guys see this is obviously a parabola. So a parabola always has a vertex at the very top. Your job is to find out how long does it take from this um, launch point? How long does it take to get up there? From what you know in like, this calls for like basic algebra two and pre-calculus knowledge of how you can work with parabolas to find the minimum or maximum. And what is this maximum height? So there's the zenith. So we, all we have to do is find what the time is and um, what the height is. Make sure in your answer, there's a very common error. You will probably not, you would probably try to map this parabola. Make sure at the end to include this 50 meters, add 50 meters to your answer if you're calculating via directly this parabola, like trying to find what the height of it is. Um, if not, it would, it would be like you started from the ground and did the parabola thing instead. Very important. I'll just underline this here. Now, if you guys have any answers or you guys want to work it out, I'll, leave, I'll give you guys a few minutes. And um, if you're done early, you can put the answers in the chat. Uh, can I give the equations again? Sure. So you have... Um, here, you do not really need 
delta, you do not need any of the x equations. We never ask for anything relating to the x side. So I think the main equation you need here is delta y, the displacement, is equal to um, v0yt. Note the usage of v0y, not v0, minus 1 half of g t square. So I think this is going to be your main equation that you're going to use. So, um, well then, I'll leave you guys to it. So this is basically calculating what your height is in terms of the y component. Does anyone want to share their answers if they have one, or do you guys need more time? Uh, you're always welcome to have more time if this problem is confusing. But if you have an answer, um, you could, again, put it in the chat, or you guys can try saying it. So I'll give you guys, uh, let's say until around 7.09, does that seem like enough time? So that's about, from what I see, that's so about another three minutes or so. Yeah, uh, okay. So uh, I'll be back up with you guys on uh, when the minute hand reaches mine.
Okay, so it's 7.09 now. So would anyone like to share an answer? Um, or tell me how they attempted to try to solve this question. What method would you guys use? Um, you can got, you guys can put it in the chat or you guys can uh, unmute and state like what method you guys use. It's it's okay. It's okay. Um. So, yeah, that seems like a good way to try to solve it. Um. Note that it's not four, but it's forty. Uh, because in the problem it's giving us forty meters per second. But yeah, trying to solve for um. Uh, four and then plug in v zero and then, um, for reference, g is always going to be nine point eight. Uh, it's constant, so. It's always going to be nine point eight. I should, I could, I could have put it here, but then G here just stands for A, which is not always going to be. True. But yeah, that's the one of the, that's that's a good first step. So how we would do this is um, try to rewrite this into a parabolic equation. So um, we would use again. We would start with the kinematic equation for vertical velocity. That was like one of the things we talked about earlier on. So we would start with Vy is equal to um, here. You would say that Y minus Y zero or like delta Y is equal to one half of GT squared plus V zero sine T. Now you guys can turn this into a quadratic function and then you guys can complete the square. So um, if you guys completed the square, your constant value would be about 61.22. Um, and then your T would be around 3.5. Uh, here would be 3.53. Now, another, oh, another way you guys can do it is that um, one of the facts is that when we reach this apex, this top part, the Y velocity, the Y component will be zero. Now, that does not, that does not mean the ball will stop moving because there's still an x component driving the ball forward so you'll never uh, observe the ball reaching or resting it, it will never it, it will never be resting but um the vy component at the top will always be zero because this v starts to slow down and then it starts dropping and then when it drops then v will turn negative so we can actually use this kinematic equation as well. Vy is equal to V0y minus Vt. Basically, V is equal to V0 plus At, except we substituted in all the appropriate values. Now, we know what each of these are. We know what Vy is, it's zero. V0 is 40 in this case. Sinus theta is sinus 60, which is the equivalent, the equivalent of the square root of three over two, and g is 9.8. So solving for t, you get the same answer, but t, it should be about 3.53. Now like that it does allow some room for margin of error. There, it's not obviously 100% accurate, but it should definitely be very close, if not the same. Now, either way, you would eventually end up having to use this delta y. So you would have y max is equal to um, one, negative one half of 9.8 times 3.53 squared plus 40 times sine 60 times 3.53. Here, we already substituted your t. You would get 61.22 meters. Now, this is the displacement of y with respect um, to um, the point here, this, uh, this uh, let's call it like, X, this starting point has to be with respect to that. So that means that this vertical um, red line here, we know that this length is about 61 meters. Now, that does not mean that the entire, this height to the ground is 61 meters because this is just 61 meters above the building. The building itself is 50 meters tall. So you have to tack on the 50 meters to the 61 meters. So summing these up, you would get um, oops, 
about like a hundred and eleven, uh, a hundred eleven point two two meters. As that is their final um maximum height of the ball. Does everyone understand where that came from? Okay. So since we're a bit short of time, uh, I'll walk through questions three and four and be, I will just give like question five for you guys as like extra practice. So if you guys want a solution, you guys can email me. Uh, my email I think is posted on the Logistem website. So here we have a golfer that's playing golf. Uh, if the golf ball is hit in the, in the direction of a 12 meter tree, that is 80 meters away, um, and we're given in, in uh, this question, we are given a diagram. So we have this initial velocity being 45 meters per second and the angle of inclination that means that the angle that the club hits the ball, that's 20 meter, that's 20 um, degrees facing up or like here above horizontal. And uh, the tree is 80 meters away. So will the ball pass over the tree or will it get stuck in the tree? Here we mean obviously if passing over the tree, that means that the travel, the height that the ball travels when this um, X component is uh, 80 meters, not the velocity, but the component of X, when that is equal to 80 degrees, uh, the 80 meters, sorry, then uh, what is this Y? What is this height? And how does this compare to the 12 meter height of the tree? So that is our problem. So how we can obviously do this is since we are given an initial velocity, we can break this um, into two components. So we have the V zero X, this is equal to 45 times sine of 20. Uh, so we have 45 sine of 20, right? Sorry, cosine of 20. So here, cosine of 20 is 45 uh, times 45. That's equal to the V0x component. And then we have the V0y component. And that is equal, that's equal to 45 times sine. <laughs> Don't be like me and constantly mix up these two. One is always affiliated with the vertical axis, and one is always affiliated with the horizontal axis. Um So uh, we are actually given what the delta x is. Here it's 80 meters. So um, we have t. You can immediately just figure out what t is by dividing this 80 um, divided by um, 45 of cosine. 20. And then we can then use this T to be plugged in. You can you then use T and plug it into the Y displacement equation. So on this next slide, I'll just show you like the entire solution of this thing. So we would use um, this. We would find, first find what T is. This is about 1.89 seconds. And then um, we have to use this Y um, kinematic equation, this is the same thing as delta y, this is another way of writing. This is equal to v0 times sine of theta 0 times t, that's the initial velocity in terms of the y component, and then minus 1 half times 3 times t squared, this is always going to be the same in terms of general projectiles. So we are given a lot of things here. We're given that y0 is equal to 0, right? And basically, I mean that it starts off from 0. We just solved for what t was. And we're given that V0 is 45 and obviously theta is 20. So we have, we can just substitute in everything. So this displacement of Y is equal to 45 times sine 20, right? Times T minus 4.9, that's one half of 9.8 times 1.892 squared. So we have about our total Y height when the ball travels 80 meters horizontally is about 11.579. Uh, meters. This is obviously less than 12 meters, so the ball will end up getting hitting the tree and getting stuck in it. 
Um, okay, so this will be our final question and we're gonna go through it very quickly. So this is a question about reference frame. This is why reference frame is so important. Now in a river, um, the current is very, it travels somewhere, right? A river is not just stagnant water. So when a boat wants to travel across the river, if it just directly tries to travel perpendicular to the flow or just directly like the shortest distance from one side to another, it'll end up being drift, it'll end up drifting away. And then if you like, there's a house here that they want to get to, they'll end up at a great distance away from the house and they have to travel back up. So here, this problem is acknowledging our reference frame. So the boat, when you're on the boat, you'll never see this current. You'll just think you're traveling. But if you're a person staying on the shore, you'll see this boat go in a diagonal motion. You guys can verify this by trying to slide like a toy car across a moving carpet or a moving sheet of paper. The car will actually end up moving diagonally. So this, let's say we have a boat here traveling straight across the river at a speed of 0 0.75 meters per second. So this current in the river, however, flows at a speed of 1.2 meters per second to the right. Or here, this would, if you had compass directions, this would be east, west, north, south, but we're gonna say left and right or upstream, downstream. What is the total displacement of the boat relative to the shore? That means that a person is standing on the shore and the boat eventually lands like here. What is this total displacement? So how we would solve this is, um, let's say we call this um, BTOT. We have two vectors, as you can see in this diagram here. We have obviously our quote unquote distance across the river traveled and we have our uh, vector that represents the flow of the river. Now, in order to get this total displacement or this total V, um, we have to add up our two speeds. So here we're trying to figure out what the, actually the net velocity, the total velocity of the boat is. So we have to add these up by using the Pythagorean theorem. Remember this is a right triangle because it's traveling straight across the river. We know it's a Pythagorean triangle. It may not always be the Pythagorean tri triangle, but normally this angle direction is given. So if it's not, you would use the law of cosines. Um, okay, so the velocity is 0 0.575 and then uh, the velocity of the river. So we will do um, the square root of the square of y, and then we will get this total velocity being 1.42 meters. And obviously we, ha we can't just get our magnitude. This is just a magnitude. Um, we have to get our angle as well. So how we will do this is that since we have the two legs of the right triangle, you guys can use the inverse tangent because we know what the tangent is then. Inverse tangent. So theta is equal to inverse tangent. Remember to set your calculators to degrees, not radians. So we will get it theta to be about 32 degrees. So then um, we know it's being swept rapidly downstream um, at an angle that is 32 degrees, uh, whoops, uh, 32 degrees um, up from directly right. So it's about like, like this type of angle. As you can so, um, it's rapidly swept downstream, and all you have to do is find now how to find. All we have to do is find out how long the river is or how far you traveled, and then you can then find your total displacement. So, this is more of a conceptual question. You may see these types of problems now. Uh, you might see these on my contest and stuff. Now, it's already about like 7.25, so we're gonna just wrap up. So um, this is basically just a short introduction to like motion in, to general mo motion in two dimensions. There's obviously motion in more than two dimensions, such as three dimensions, but the same concepts apply. So instead of here X and Y, you would have an X, Y, Z, each of these will act independently of one another. Um, General projectile is very commonly seen in AP physics if you guys plan on taking that in the future. 
And you will see it in some early problems of F equals MA. So it's very important to try to master this concept. Okay, so that's all for today. So do you guys have any questions uh, or concerns? Um, if not, uh, you guys are free to leave the meeting now and uh, I'll see you guys later. Um, thank you for attending.